A Present Religion A Sermon Number 196 Delivered on Sabbath morning, May 30, 1858 By the Reverend C. H. Spurgeon at the Music Hall, Royal Surrey Gardens Beloved, now we are the sons of God 1 John 3, 2 I shall not pretend to preach from the whole of my text this morning, short though it be. The word now is to me the most prominent word in the text, and I shall make it so this morning. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It is astonishing how distance blunts the keen edge of anything that is disagreeable. War is at all times a most fearful scourge. The thought of slain bodies and of murdered men must always harrow up the soul. But because we hear of these things in the distance, there are few Englishmen who can truly enter into their horrors. If we should hear the booming of cannon on the deep which girdles this island, if we should see at our doors the marks of carnage and bloodshed, then should we more thoroughly appreciate what war means. But distance takes away the horror, and we therefore speak of war with too much levity and even read of it with an interest not sufficiently linked with pain. As it is with war, so it is with death. Death is a frightful thing. He who is the bravest must still fear before it, for at best it is a solemn thing to die. Man, therefore, adopts the expedient of putting off all thoughts of death. It may be very near to him, but he conceives it to be at a distance, and when the same effect is produced as when war is at a distance, its horror is forgotten, and we speak of it with less solemnity. So, likewise, with true religion, men are constrained to believe that there is truth in religion. Though there are some foolhardy enough to deny it, the most of us in this enlightened land are obliged to acknowledge that there is a power in godliness. What, then, does the worldling do? he practices the same expedient. He puts religion far away. He knows that its disagreeableness will be diminished by his believing it to be distant. Hence there has sprung up in the minds of the unregenerate world a notion that religion is a thing to be accomplished just at the close of life. And the usual prayer of an ungodly man, when in the slightest degree pricked in his conscience, is, Oh, that I may be saved at last! He does not feel anxious to be saved now. Religion is a thing for which he has no appetite, and therefore, believing it essential to ensure his eternal welfare, he adopts the alternative of saying, I hope to have it at last. The religion, then, of the present is not the worldling's religion. He tolerates that which speaks of eternity, that which deals with dying beds, that which leads him to look back with a specious repentance upon a life spent in sin, but not that which will enable him to look forward to a life spent in holiness. Very differently, however, do we act with affairs of the present life, for things that are sweet to us become the more sweet by their nearness. Was there ever a child who longed for his father's house, who did not feel that the holidays grew more sweet in his estimation, the shorter the time was that he had to tarry? What man is there? who, having once set his heart on riches, did not find his delight in the thought of being rich, increase with the nearness of his approach to the desired object. And are we not all of us accustomed, when we think a good thing is at a distance, to try if we can shorten the time between us and it? We try anything and everything to push on the lagging hours. We chide them, wish that time had double wings, that he might swiftly fly, and bring the expected season. When the Christian talks of heaven, you will always hear him try to shorten the distance between himself and the happy land. He says, A few more rolling suns at most will land me on fair Canaan's coast. There may be many years between him and paradise, but still he is prone to say, The way may be rough, but it cannot be long. Thus do we all delight to shorten the distance between us and the things for which we hope. Now, let us apply this rule to religion. They who love religion love a present thing. The Christian who really seeks salvation will never be happy unless he can say, Now I am a child of God. 
because the worldling dislikes it he puts it from him because the Christian loves it therefore its very fairest feature is its present existence its present enjoyment in his heart that word now which is the sinner's warning and his terror is to the Christian his greatest delight and joy there is therefore and then the sweetest bell of all rings there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus to the sinner that same idea is the blackest of all he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the Son of God this morning in God's name I shall endeavor to plead with men and show them the importance of having a present religion I am quite certain that this is a habit which is too much kept in the background I am sure from mixing with mankind that the current belief is that religion is a future thing perhaps the wish is father to the thought I am certain the ground of it is men love not religion and therefore they desire to thrust it far from them I shall commence by endeavouring to show that religion must be a thing of the present because the present has such intimate connection with the future and to proceed we are told in scripture that this life is a seed time and the future is the harvest he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting the scripture often speaks to us in words like these they that sow in tears shall reap in joy it is always supposed in scripture that this life is a time of generating if I may use such an expression the life that is to come as a seed generates the plant even so doth this present life generate the eternal future we know indeed that heaven and hell are after all but the developments of our present character for what is hell but this he that is filthy let him be filthy still he that is unholy let him be unholy still do we not know that in the bowels of every sin damnation slumbers is it not a fearful truth that the germ of everlasting torment sleeps in every vile wish every unholy thought every unclean act so that hell is but a great breaking out of slumbering lava which had been so quiet that while the mountain was covered with fair verdure even to its summit death comes and bides that lava rise and down the steeps of manhood's eternal existence the fiery flame the hot scalding lava of eternal misery doth pour itself yet it was there before for sin is hell and to rebel against God is but the prelude of misery so is it with heaven I know that heaven is a reward not of debt but of grace but still the Christian has that within him which forestall for him a heaven what did Christ say I give unto my sheep eternal life he did not say I will give but I give unto them as soon as they believe in me I give them eternal life and he that believeth hath eternal life and shall never come into damnation the Christian hath within him the seed beds of a paradise in due time the light that is sown for the righteous and the gladness that is buried beneath the black earth for the upright in heart shall spring up and they shall reap the harvest is it not plain then that religion is a thing which we must have here is it not prominently revealed that religion is important for the present for if this life be the seed time of the future how can I expect to reap in another world other crops than I have been sowing here how can I trust that I shall be saved unless I am saved how can I have hope that heaven shall be my eternal inheritance unless the earnest be begun in my own soul on earth but again this life is always said in scripture to be a preparation for the life to come prepare to meet thy God O Israel they that were ready went in with him to the supper and the door was shut there is in this world a getting ready for another world to use a biblical figure 
we must here put on the wedding dress which we are to wear for ever. This life is as the vestibule of the king's court. We must put off our shoes from off our feet, we must wash our garments and make ourselves ready to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Somehow, in Scripture, the thought comes out as plain as if written with a sunbeam. This world is the beginning of the end. It is the preparing place for the future. Supposing you have no religion now, how will you stand when now is turned into eternity? When days and years are gone, how will it fare with you, if all your days have been spent without God and without Christ? Do you hope to hurry on a white garment after death? Alas, you shall be girt with your shroud, but not be able to put on the wedding raiment.